Jill. Can you all hear me? I thought I'd show a slide of Calum Scott in the winter because um, <laughs> staff who uh, live and work there all through the winter know exactly why Morris only lived there in the summer. <laughs> so although it is beautiful, it is always cold at Calum Scott in the winter, or wet or both. Um, we all know Morris the artist, designer, political thinker, uh, but what of Morris the antiquary and fellow of this society? Uh, I'm just going to spend a few minutes setting out uh, one of the strands of our project, and both Sandy and Peter have, have touched on this, uh, and that is the part that um, history um, and archaeology and the depth of time and ancient landscapes played in influencing Morris. Um, we know that our own estate um, has uh, barns and buildings that Morris loved uh, and inspired him and um, was intensely interested in. Um, and I think it's just worth doing two quotes from, from, from Morris. Um, he was fascinated with the past. He wrote of his school days in Marlborough, the place in very beautiful country, thickly scattered with prehistoric monuments. And I set myself eagerly to studying these and everything else of the history in it. And also, in 1888, he wrote to Jane, I gave uh, May and um, uh, Janie, his, his daughters, a lecture on archaeology, which I went on with yesterday in Kelmscott Church. And I think he went on with it for about two days. <laughs> so, <laughs> if that didn't put them off archaeology, then nothing would. But... He was intensely interested in, in the past. And of course, he's using archaeology in its very broadest sense. Before, unfortunately, archaeology became compartmentalized and, and rigidly defined. And um, he was talking about archaeology as the study of the past and the things that we made in the past. Uh, in other words, as uh, Peter said, a true antiquary. And it's that sort of strand that I, as an archaeologist, am very interested in. How, how many archaeologists are here today? Three. That's kind of interesting. And Headley, I don't know whether you count anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but that's very interesting, isn't it? Um, I thought I'd show you actually where Kelmscott is. Um, here it is in the Upper Thames, uh, near Letchlade. And... Um, it has a very, very deep past, going way back into uh, prehistory. And our project, I suppose, one of the strands I'm talking about, and this is something our uh, last speaker, John Madison, summed up, uh, and I've put it into crude terms, is um, we want to look at what Kelmscott did to Morris rather than what Morris did to Kelmscott. And presently, the visitors to the manor gain very little sense of that long history of the house or its surrounding landscape. And our displays there do not reflect the mission of the society in exploring the past in its fullest sense or the impact the past had on Morris. Uh, there is little explanation of the Kelmscott estate and buildings, the village, or its surrounding landscape up until the last year or so when we've now produced lovely maps for visitors to walk from the village through the historic land, uh, landscape in the village to our manor. Um, so the history of the landscape is ancient indeed. This, uh, to the non-archaeologists, uh, is a plot out of all the archaeological crop marks around Kelmscott. There's the village, there's the manor, and you can see all these crop marks all running around. There are um, prehistoric, probably Bronze Age settlements, uh, Romano-British and Iron Age settlements, medieval um, trackways. Interestingly, you can see some of them run down to off the gravel terrace where the village is built higher up onto the alluvium and they disappeared and this shows that the alluvium is actually buried archaeology so underneath this area there will be buried archaeology pres beautifully preserved beneath the alluvium and you can see the richness of the archaeological remains all around the village and three to four kilometers away there are two great Neolithic Cursus monuments built between 3600 and 3300 BC Buscut Wick and Letchlade so even in the fourth millennium BC, it was a, an incredibly rich ceremonial landscape. That is an incredibly um, deep um, time history that, that we don't uh, 
currently explore. And just to illustrate the potential we have to look at that, that is our estate in green, uh, right in the middle uh, of that amazing series of crop marks. And there we are, 12 and a half acres. There's the manor house and the barns, uh, our cottages, and the, um, the field barns, another cottage. We have another barn out here and some more land up in the centre of the village. And here's the, the Thames, and this would all be alluvium down there, and there's the, the Radcot Cut. So it's a, it's a, it's a relatively um, extensive estate. I just want to look now at one of the things um, that we might wish to look at. And one of the things that's intrigued me, and this is the impact that Kelmscott had on me as an archaeologist, um, when I was walking through the village one day. Um, those of you who've been there will probably know the, the church, the uh, 12th, 13th century church, which is in fact the resting place of, uh, of the Morris family in the churchyard. Um, and the beautiful wall paintings still survive uh, in <coughs> fragments inside the church. Again, 13th century, I believe, uh, but somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. But as you walk through the village, um, there are some beautiful houses. This is Manor Farm, and uh, down at the bottom here, there's um, Home for Farm and Bradshaw's Farm. Um, as far as I can tell, very few of the buildings, in fact, I can't see any, um, that predate, uh, like the manor, about 1600. So the question that I popped up in my mind is, where is medieval Kelmscott? Um, because we know it's, it is, uh, you know, the church is there, 12th, 13th century. We've got records of Kelmscott being there before. Well, um, some of you may recognize this. This is the lane heading down towards the manor. Uh, and there's our North Road barn there. And the entrance to the manor is there, just down there. And there's the South Road barn. And there's one of our cottages. And as you walk down this lane towards the Thames, most visitors pass this field, this rather unprepossessing field, don't really give it a second look, possibly again look at the wall, of course, which again is listed, um, or unless there's a bull in the field, which is quite intimidating. But if you look in that field, there it is again, there's the cottage. This area is raised here, and in fact, when Kelmscott floods, which it does with all too depressing regularity, this area is completely underwater, but this area always remains dry. And if there was going to be a location for medieval buildings, or indeed, uh, as I, my little pet theory is, an earlier Kelmscott house, then I would suggest that this is a pretty good place to start looking. So, what we wish to do is as part of our project, we want to um, start surveying parts of our estate using archaeological techniques and involving um, volunteers and community groups in that work to actually look at the deeper past uh, and marry that deeper past up with our standing buildings and then tell that story within the manor and present that story to the, the general public. And I think putting it into rather more formal language, um, we want to get that depth of time all the way back to the prehistoric period and the breadth of the landscape and tell people about the excitement of the past and actually show how that influenced Morris and then looking at the past through Morris's eyes, showing how Morris is still so important to us today. Thank you very much.